Please note that this podcast contains information regarding sensitive events, including domestic violence, assault, and abuse, as well as other triggering events, such as murder. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. When Alice jumped down the rabbit hole, she immediately regretted her decision. A rabbit hole is a metaphor for something that transports someone into a troubling, surreal state or situation. Welcome to Afterglow, the unveiling of the Idaho cult, season two. This podcast will take you down the deepest of rabbit holes as it unfolds. The story is so compelling, so bizarre, and so heinous, it's impossible to look the other way. Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow were dedicated in the most horrible way to an ideology that should only be fiction. Instead, their ideology put them behind bars. Join us as we explore the lives, lies, and diabolical crimes of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. I'm your host, Kathy Brooks. Please follow and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. This is Season 2, Episode 11, The Death of Alex Cox. We're just going to jump right into it right now. Thank you all for staying up to date with me on this podcast. I'm kind of going to try to jam a little bit here because Lori Vallow, I think we've dropped the day bell, not entirely sure, is going to trial in two weeks time. She is scheduled to go to trial the first week of April. So going to try to catch up as best we can and keep going so we can stay caught up through the trial. Chad will be going to trial later. Those that don't know, this cases have been severed. But here we go. I want to catch you up. So this episode is about the death of Alex Cox. Now remember, during the last episode, Melanie Gibb had called Lori and Chad and sort of put them on the spot, called Lori a Korahor, and tensions were rising. At that point, Melanie Gibb disassociated herself with Chad and Lori, according to everyone and everything that I've read and what Melanie Gibb has said. At that point, I think she realized how bad everything was and that she could also be held accountable for something, very possibly, especially since she lied about having JJ. So during this week, December 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th week, law enforcement was actually watching Alex and Zulema. They were getting very suspicious of them. They found some mail that actually they intercepted that had Alex, Zulema, Lori, and Chad on it. On December 11th, 2019, Tammy's body was exhumed because now everybody was getting really suspicious. They knew children were missing. They knew Chad and Lori were on the run. They knew Charles had been shot. They knew Tammy was dead and everything was starting to fall together for law enforcement. And they were going, okay, there is no such thing as coincidences like this. So Tammy's body was exhumed and put back literally the same day. It was, she wasn't even exhumed for 24 whole hours. They got what they needed. They put her back. And apparently the family had no idea. There is a conversation between the kids, Chad's kids and Chad, where they said that their uh, law enforcement is threatening to exhume Tammy. Apparently they had no idea that that had already happened. Ian Pulowski was the source for that information. So here's a back report a little bit about what led up to Charles, as a reminder, being very suspicious that Chad and Lori were up to no good. And he reached out to Tammy. This was right before Tammy died, right before Charles died. And soon after, as we know, Tammy passed away as well. So here's a little news clip on that. 
Was Tammy Daybell aware of her husband Chad Daybell's affair with Lori Vallow? Detectives in Chandler, Arizona think she was. New specialist Garner Mejia continues digging into thousands of documents released in this Charles Vallow investigation. Garner, what'd you find? Yeah, you guys, detectives say the catalyst that brought about Charles Vallow's murder was his discovering the affair between his wife, Lori Vallow, and Chad Daybell. It appears the same day Charles found out about the affair, he contacted Tammy Daybell. Did you think that Chad and Lori had done something to Tammy? Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow were married two weeks after the death of Chad's wife, Tammy Daybell. Detectives already suspected Lori in the death of her husband, Charles Vallow. But it wasn't until Tammy's body was exhumed that a member of Chad and Lori's inner circle, Zulema Pastenes, told detectives she also became suspicious. Lori and Chad had called that day and they were the ones that told us that they were exhuming her her body. Zulema Pastenes was married to Alex Cox, Lori's brother. She told detectives Chad had a vision Tammy would die two weeks before her actual demise. Tammy was supposed to die on her trip to um, Utah. She was supposed to have a, he was, like he had seen it in a vision that she was going to die in a car accident. But when Tammy didn't die as predicted, Chad claimed she was a zombie, according to Zulema. They were saying was that she actually did pass away, but what happened was that she was taken over by an evil spirit. Days before Charles Vallow was shot and killed by Alex, detectives say Charles discovered Chad and Lori's infidelity. In an email, Charles confronted Chad, telling him to come clean or he would, quote, expose them. Detectives say Charles also sent an email to Tammy saying in part, Quote, I have some disturbing information regarding your husband and my wife. In later text messages, Charles told Lori he planned on going to Idaho to meet with Tammy. Lori replied, quote, she won't see you. She is my friend. Go ahead. You're ridiculous. Now, a grand jury indicted Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell and Tammy Daybell's murder up in Idaho. Tammy's cause of death and autopsy results remain under lock and key in that investigation. We've yet to find that out. We'll send it back to you. All right. Lots of new information. Garna, thank you. So right now, I want to go over December 10th, 11th, and 12th. There's a lot of stuff simultaneously going on. So stick with me here. On December 10th, 2019, Lori and Chad move into a lovely condo in Princeville, Hawaii. Beautiful condo for rent for about three to $4,000 a month and for sale for over 700,000 at the time. Justin Lum was able to talk to somebody that remained anonymous and that person did see Lori and Chad in this condo complex. And it said, Justin Lum had posted while FBI and Rexburg police have been investigating the disappearance of seven-year-old JJ and 17-year-old Tylee Ryan, I've learned when their mother, Lori Vallow, arrived in Princeville, Hawaii with her husband, Chad Daybell. A source who wants to be kept anonymous for safety reasons tells me the newlywed couple moved into this condo around December 10th, 2019. The condo is located in a gated community called Villas on the Prince. It sits on the Prince golf course. The source tells me Lori and Chad have been seen hanging by the pool several times. But other than that, they weren't seen around the neighborhood much. The condo has three bedrooms and three bathrooms. It's about 1,700 square feet and selling for $719,900. The source tells Justin, Chad and Lori came off as pleasant and nice, and there was no indication they had any kids with them. Lori likes the finer things in life. This is probably the nicest part of Kauai that you could live on. So also on December 10th, 2019, Alex asks Chad to give him a blessing because he was having a bad attack and he couldn't breathe. The next day, on December 11th, 2019, Chad asks Alex how he's doing and Alex responds that he's winded every time he stands up and has a resting pulse of 100. Later that same day, Alex texts back to Chad and says, I feel like the poison from the spear in the heart has done some residual damage. I don't know if that's literal or metaphoric. With these people, you have no idea. Did 
Alex purposely take some poison? Did Alex commit suicide? What, did these people tell him to do this? He believed everything they said. And why are they so in the know about what's going on? And no one is telling Alex to go to the hospital? So according to Zilema, Chad gave Alex a blessing during all this of some sort. Now on December 11th, 2019, that same day that Alex is getting this blessing from Chad and feeling winded and not good and not going to the hospital and not seeking medical care, Tammy's remains are exhumed by the Fremont County Sheriff's Office. There was a press release at that point released to the public. It says the Rexburg Police Department and the Fremont County Sheriff's Office, with the assistance of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, are investigating the possible connection between the death of a Fremont County woman and two missing Rexburg children. On October 19, 2019, family members found Tammy Daybell, 49, dead in her Fremont home. At that time, Daybell's death was believed to be natural. Daybell was interred in Springville, Utah on October 22, 2019. Subsequent investigation by the FCSO determined that Daybell's death may be suspicious. On December 11, 2019, Daybell's remains were exhumed by the FCSO with the assistance of the Utah Office of the Medical Examiner and or autopsy was conducted. During the course of the death investigation by FCSO, investigators were made aware that two Rexburg children, aged 7 and 17, were missing. Investigators determined that within a couple of weeks of Daybell's death, her surviving husband, Chad Daybell, had married Rexburg's resident, Lori Vallow, who's the mother of the missing children. And then the press release goes into the background. So this is when it's hitting the news here. So let's listen to this clip regarding Tammy's body being exhumed and what was going on. As the search for her children, Tylee Ryan and JJ Vallow continues. Question remain about the death of Chad Daybell's late wife, Tammy. Yeah, it has been three months since the 49-year-old's body was exhumed from her grave in Springville, Utah. The same town the couple called home for nearly 20 years. As case investigator Brittany Glass explains, it is also where authorities suspect that they could uncover exhumed evidence needed to crack open this case. Tucked under a large, sprawling tree at Springville's Evergreen Cemetery. When someone is buried, you hope you don't have to ever disturb that uh, ground. So I, I look at this as a very humble area right now in this cemetery. The dirt's disrupted. This is the grave where Tammy Daybell was laid to rest and where her body was exhumed on the morning of December 11th. We did it as confidential as we could that uh, our parks workers ended up here on a Wednesday morning at six o'clock, um, lights on their tractors. Loved ones were not in attendance at her gravesite like they were just five months before at her funeral. But as Rod Oldroyd with the city of Springville explains, multiple witnesses were. County attorneys, the sheriff from Idaho, sheriff from Utah, um, coroners, coroner's assistants. Tammy's body was taken to the Utah State Office of the Medical Examiner for an autopsy. To this day, if I thought of Tammy Daybell, it would be that she's smiling and she's happy. By 2.30 that afternoon, just eight hours later, Tammy's body was returned, once again underground in small town Springville, back where so much of the couple's story began. I have known Chad and Tammy for a long, long time, as many people in Springville have. Chad and his late wife grew up in town. They both graduated from Springville High School. They went to high school together, and she worked for Springville City when they were engaged. She was responsible for a lot of the billing, so ambulance billing, cemetery billing. In fact, they both worked there. Chad worked for Springville City several times. Chad worked for the city off and on from 1985 until 2014. Digging graves, maintaining the cemetery, making sure the lawns are cut. Um, pruning the trees, a little bit of everything. And apparently, it was a family tradition. A 1992 Deseret News article tells the story of the Daybell brothers digging Springville graves to pay for their BYU educations. In 2001, Chad's work got more attention and another D News story when he said his experience left him with many memorable moments from both the living and the dead. 
Chad resigned in October 2014. He did a good job. We, we hated to have him go. The Daybells moved to Idaho shortly thereafter. Almost five years later, in their Salem, Idaho home, Tammy died. According to her obituary, the 49-year-old passed away peacefully in her sleep, originally believed to be a natural death. And because Idaho law did not require an autopsy, the family had the option to decline one, and did. Every state has a different death investigation system. That likely Most, wouldn't have been the case if Tammy concerned. had died in Utah. Our state law requires yeah. certain types of deaths be reported to the state office of the medical examiner. Dr. Eric Christensen. Deaths that occur in, you know, suddenly, unexpectedly, by violence, um, child deaths, deaths in custody. And when it comes to a possible criminal investigation. If we think someone in our care was killed by someone else, we try and figure out if there is evidence that can be collected that would implicate that. Tammy's cause and manner of death have yet to be officially determined. A final autopsy report hasn't been publicly released. There's actually 100% Springville ties to this case, but whether or not anything happens here or happened here is yet to be seen. But local law enforcement is prepared to respond. And if we need to get involved, we will. As speculation mounts against Chad Daybell and his new wife, Lori, the community can't help but think about how things are so different now. Obviously, you hope it's not true. It's hard to think of everything that's going on, you know, because we knew them when everything was fine. But without those answers, at least for Tammy Daybell, resting in peace may be postponed. And you look at that and just go, boy, there's a lot of questions that aren't answered yet. So hopefully that will come. We could get Tammy's autopsy results literally any day now. The standard the state tries to meet is getting 90% of autopsy reports done within 60 days. We've now passed that goal by a month. All right, so why are the results taking so long? Any idea? Well, Mike Dini, it could be for a number of reasons. Obviously, those results are not public in our state. But from my conversation with the chief ME, I learned that with any autopsy, all the samples are collected and there could be so many tests done. It's almost like a maze, depending on the results of the first few tests, you can go down a rabbit hole of sorts to take other tests and to finally get that answer that you need. So now it really just is a wait and see game. Law enforcement will be notified, though, when the results come back. We'll be anxiously waiting. Yes, Thanks, I will. Brittany. All right, thank you. So it's December 12th, 2019. There's a lot going on in this day. Apparently, Melanie Gipp and David Warwick get married on this day. And, well, this is the end of Alex, December 12th, 2019. Alex dies at 4.19 p.m. Zalema Pastina's 25-year-old son, Joseph, finds Alex on the floor and calls 911. Now, you will hear Zalema explain some of this in a little bit because I have the body cam footage that I'm going to play the audio for. But from what the story is and how weird and suspicious it sounds, Zalema says that Zalema says that a friend of mine gave him a blessing because he hadn't been feeling well. And then the friend of mine, Chad and Lori, the friend of mine called me and told me I should check on him. Now, Zalema's not home, conveniently. So Chad and Lori give this, Tad gives this blessing to Alex. They're in Hawaii. Zlema's not home. They call Zlema. This is all according to Zlema. And they say, you need to check on Alex. So apparently Zlema either calls or texts her 25-year-old son, Joseph, and says, go check on Alex. Joseph goes to find Alex and he finds him on the floor. And this is where the 911 call seems to come in. Let me play that for you now. December 12th, 2019, 15 hours, 20 minutes, 19 seconds. 911, where is your emergency? Hi, I need an ambulance to... Yes. Why do you need an ambulance? Um, I have a, a older male, a middle-aged male. Um, um, he is breathing? Yes, he's breathing, but very, very uh, high, highly breathing. Okay, let me let me transfer you to Mesa or 
the medics do not hang up. Okay. Is it just due to a fire and medical? What is the address of your emergency? Go over with it. Caller, are you on the line? Hello, is everyone there? Yes, this is this. Okay, you're at first. Yes, that's correct. Okay, what is your emergency? Um, I have uh, a older male here named Alex. He's uh, he just passed out here on the on my on my bathroom. Okay, is he awake Wait, right now? I think he's passed out. Okay, you think he's unconscious? Yes. Okay, is he breathing normally? Like you can see his chest rising and falling. Hello. I hope so. I have the paramedics on the way, but I need you to try to help me with some information while they're driving there to help him. Okay. Okay. How old is he? Uh, he seems to be in his 40s. Okay. Do you know him? No, it's my mother's boyfriend. Okay. And how old are you? I'm 25. Okay. Just to interrupt, my mother's boyfriend. Remember, they're married. Apparently, Joseph doesn't know this. I have the paramedics on the way, so he's in the restroom right now. Okay. Gilbert, can we get you started? I'm already in route. All right, thank you. Okay, is he on his back or on his stomach? Where is he at? He's on his side. Okay. Can you lay him flat on his back on the ground? Um, I'll try. It's just there's feces there, and I'm trying to just keep cool right now. Um, you said he's what? There's feces on the ground. His, okay. I know that's gross, but if we can just go ahead and get him flat on his back, I want to make sure he's breathing, because if he's not, we're going to do a few things. Gotcha. Did you say he's cool, like cold? Alex. Alex. Alex, you got to get him on your back. Does he seem more awake or more asleep? He's more passed out. Okay. Is he opening his eyes or moving at all? He's breathing. Okay. Is he breathing normally like his chest is rising and falling? He's not making any weird sounds? Yeah. He's uh, making a very exhale sound like... Okay. If he's doing that, we need to start CPR. So I need you to get him flat on his back on the ground. Okay. I'll do that. Let me know when he's flat on his back, and we're going to give you instructions, okay? Okay. Alex. What is your first name? I don't think I can do that, man. I know this is difficult, but you're only helping him, okay? I know, the paramedic. What is your name? Okay, what's your name? What is your name? My name's Joseph. Joseph? Okay, Joseph, the best thing for us to do for him right now is to... So if you'll just take... Oh, fuck. I know it's not ideal, but you're doing a really good job by helping him if you can do that, okay? He's not breathing. No. No, he's too big. Okay, just try to get him on his back so we can do chest compression. My my mother just got here. Okay, give her the phone then. (laughs) So, did she say the mother just got there? Yeah. Come here. Come and we're coming on mineral right now. Really we're bad. almost there. It's really bad. Come up there. In the bathroom. We need to get him on his back. Can you put your mom on the phone? She's, up, she's right here. You're on speaker. Hi. 
Okay, ma'am, the paramedics are pulling up, but in the meantime, we need him to get flat on his back and we need to give him chest compressions, okay? Chest compressions. But Does she know how to do CPR? Yes. She knows how. Okay. How far are you? We're pulling up out front right now, so they're grabbing their equipment and they're coming in. Are you on the okay. first floor or the second? We're on the second floor. Second floor in the bathroom? Yes. Okay, and the door is unlocked? Yes. yes. Okay, do you see the paramedics now? Yes. Okay, Joseph, you did a good job. I know that was really scary, but thank you for your help, okay? Joseph, okay, before you me. hang up, right. Joseph, before you hang up, I need your last yeah, name. Okay. Joseph, let the paramedics yes. do their business and tell me what your last name is. Lopez. Joseph, what's your last name? Lopez. Okay. And what's your date of birth, Joseph? Alex's last name? I don't know. You don't know his name? No. Okay. All right. Do you let the officer in? Yes. Okay. Sounds good. I'm going to let you go. Bye-bye. December 12th, 2019. 15 hours, 27 minutes, 27 seconds. So that's crazy, right? I mean, poor Joseph. He's totally traumatized here. Obviously has anxiety issues. Was really freaked out. And I still can't help to wonder why the what we know now this went down somebody knew this was happening in my opinion I mean it just is too coordinated do you know what I mean Joseph doesn't know Alex's last name Joseph doesn't know that Alex is married to his mother it's just crazy right just bizarre Alex was declared deceased at 4 19 p.m. on December 12 2019 the officer detective that was writing up this particular report says Zalema and her family refused to provide statements to me, but they talked with the initial officers. I'm going to review body warm camera footage and talk more with those who obtained statements during the service of the residential warrant. So now I'm going to share with you one of the videos that I posted. You'll hear the audio of the day that Alex died, the body cam footage of Zalema that day. Are we going to run upstairs? I'll get her out of your way. Where'd she All go? Right. Start doing compressions. Get the pads on. Got blood. It's blurry on the video, but they're doing compressions on Alex right now. Here. About 15 minutes ago. Yeah. Okay. Who found him? My mother called me and she said go check on him. Okay. So. Where was your mom at? My mom was at work. She just okay. barely got home. Okay. And she ran in and helped me with the CPR and stuff because I was having an anxiety attack. Okay. The the person on the phone uh, was trying to tell me to uh, put the fingers in the, in, her, in his mouth to remove the vomit. Right, right, right. CPR, right. but I, I, Come on over here I, I couldn't do any of that. I'm sorry. Okay. So who is he to you? Is he your dad? No, that's my mom's boyfriend. Your mom's boyfriend? Okay. Yeah. So, but it, 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 imagine it was just like real quick. My mom called me. She told me to go in there. He's on the floor. There's feces. He, there's vomit. Okay. And I didn't make it. And no, I, I get it. You're fine, man. So, why did she? Had she not heard from him? What was the deal that she called you to go check on? I don't know if he called her or my mom called me. She said, go check on him. He's okay. on the floor. Okay, had she talked to him or? I, I, okay, and yeah. she told you he was on the floor? Yeah, or? she said he was, he was having some problems. Okay, and so where were you at this point? I was in my room. You were in your room? Okay, that's yeah. in there? Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Yeah, we're PDA. We're still only at 36. Can I sit down? Yeah, no, I have a seat, man. Okay, let's just come out here. I, I'm not really powerful. I'm going to take her downstairs. What's your name, ma'am? You want to go down with your mom? Come on, honey. Come on. Dave, you take her down. Yeah. It's so good, baby. Hurry for us. What's up, PDA? What's that? PDA? Right now, yeah. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. I know the audio might be a little hard to hear just because it's the officer's body cam that the audio is coming through. And sometimes it's the officer that's standing kind of far away from her when they're speaking. So it's more difficult to hear, but I think it's important for you to hear all this because you're going to hear, you're going to hear some things that are contradictory in the end. Zulema actually tells quite a few fips in this video. And one of the fibs she said, no, no drugs, no nothing. Well, Alex had just gone to Mexico and got some medication. So he's taken something. And there's more. But just stick with me with the audio. Turn up your sound if you can. Wear earbuds. It's probably easier. And I'll go right back to it right now. And then uh, this morning, I asked him how he was, and he said, I'm feeling much better. You know, I just feel a little very nervous. It's been a few days, so it's been a few days, yes. Does he have medical, is he allergic to any medications? No, no, no. Is he taking any medications? No, he doesn't. So he doesn't see a doctor for anything? No, he doesn't. High blood pressure, 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 nothing like that, perfectly healthy? He's perfectly healthy. Okay, any, any drugs? He no one's in trouble, so no, no illegal he, drugs? No, 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 he doesn't use any illegal drugs. No drugs, no alcohol? He doesn't use alcohol, no. Okay, has he been, he, I sure tell you, he's been sick lately? No, he's just been shortness of breath. Um, when he's walking or when he's sleeping shortness of breath? Because he, he, he go for a walk without getting short of breath? Well, he's, like, he, like, he'll go up the stairs and he will get short of breath. Going up the stairs. Going okay. up the stairs. And then the last couple of days has been when he gets up, he's like, oh, I feel so winded. And he, didn't go to, he hasn't gone to a doctor for that, nothing like that? No, I've been asking for that. Does he, does he see a doctor on a regular basis? No, he doesn't. I mean, he's just the healthiest person that okay. uh, so, you can imagine. I mean, he's just so healthy. And what's your my name's Mike, this is Dave. I'm going to get you some information. So I'm just going to be as honest as I want someone to be with my, with my wife, too. So I'll, I'm just going to be honest. Let me go find some information. Do we have his license at all? Yeah. Does he have a wallet anywhere? Okay, that's fine. Yeah, no problem. I know this is a lot coming at you all at once. You're doing good. Just keep breathing, okay? I, I don't know. That's what... Mike is probably one of our best paramedics. She was blue when I walked in. What's that? She was blue when I walked in and okay. so I started yeah. doing compressions. She was blue on the face. Okay. When was the last time you talked to him? He was talking. I was at work and he was talking to one of my friends on the phone because he said that he wasn't feeling well. So my friends said that they would give him a blessing. So they were giving him a blessing over the phone. And then my friends texted me and said, you better get home now. Her friends are Chad and Lori. Chad and Lori are giving him a blessing over the phone right before all this happened. The story is really wacky, right? The way it was told was it was the day before on the 11th that he called and gave the blessing. So there's a lot of misinformation and, of my opinion, a lot of lies, cover-ups. Okay, so so I, doing a blessing over the so phone. So they were not blessing over the phone, and then my friends texted me and said, You need to get home now. He's not doing well. He's on the ground in the bathroom. So I called my son and I said, Go over there and make sure he doesn't pass out. I said, I am on my way home. And then I I just had the impression that he needed to call 911. So I just I say stay on the phone with me and then I said, No. I said, hang up and call 911 right now. Okay. What so, time was the blessing over the phone going on? You know? Best guess. I have it right here. Okay. I can't guess right now. Okay. Three. Three eighteen. Okay, three eighteen. Yeah. And I called my son at 
I called him at 3.15, so it's around, around 3.15. <clears throat> okay. And then what made them tell you to come home immediately? They said that he wasn't, he was, he wasn't, so he someone wasn't, was here with him? No, him it was on the phone. It was, they were on the phone. Okay. <clears throat> so was he talking to him? <clears throat> he was talking when I called him. And he was talking to Joseph. He was talking to you, right? No. Was he I talking? I walked in, he was passed out, Mom. And I called 911. <laughs> So when what happened when you when you said don't get up, don't get up? Remember you said don't. No, he was trying. He was trying to move and stuff. He was, oh, he was okay. like trying to like he's doing. Uh, did okay. you guys ever do any chest compressions on him at all? I did no. when I walked in. So when you, so when you got here, you did CPR. Yes. Okay, so I started compressions as soon as I walked in. Okay, so here, here's where we're at right now. Um, so he's still he doesn't have a pulse. He's not breathing. We're doing compressions on him. So we're giving him medications. We're trying to restart his heart right now. So he's in extremely critical condition. I know she's pretty flustered, but the officer asked her what time they were giving him the blessing. And she says 318. And then she said she called her son at 315. Mm. I would love to see that actual text printout of the text messages or whatever it was that she was calling or the times because that's backwards, right? They were given the blessing at 318 and she called her son at 315. I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt and say it was the opposite. And the 911 call says it was at 15 hours, 20 minutes. So 320 was when the call came in. Yeah, it's right here at the base of the stairs. Yeah, I got it. You talk to my officer. No, want me to fill in there? He'll fill you in. Okay, perfect. Uh, uh, I have no idea. Yeah, we just know him from church. Okay, got it. Okay. The only reason I'm asking is if we need to ask him, like, what the conversation was like, if he said anything out of the ordinary, or, you know, we want to make sure we're fair. What's your first name, ma'am? Were you here the whole time, Jesse? I was here, but I was in my room very close to the headphones on. Okay. And then I got a call from my mom, and that's when. when Told me to check on him, I checked on him right away, and he's telling me to call 911. Just, just do it. Okay, I was having anxiety, exactly. When I was on the phone with the um, I walked in, and there's feces in there, and he told me to roll them over on his back. I tried to do my best to roll them over on his back, but there's vomit and feces, and I probably just Okay. 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 Gotcha. Honey, you did that test. Did you have to move anything away from him, um, off of him? No. Nothing fell on him? No. As you guys found him, my mom just moved him on the back, like from, from his right side. He was on the dress and I just moved it. Just pulled his arm out so I could put him in his mouth and I just straddled him and I just started doing confessions as soon as I walked in. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, friends or family, do you guys need to call anyone to get some uh, family members coming this way? Or? I didn't see anybody. Just a mess. Would you like me to call Kara? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you ever? I'll call her if you'd like. That way we be with each other, and I'll just kind of bring her up to speed and have her step coming this way. Will that work? Yeah. Okay. And her name is Kara. Yeah. 
What's your engine company? We're Battalion 252, that's engine 2540. Battalion 252? Correct. And engine what? 2540. C shift. Cool. The next part of this is a little bit down the road that same day where Zalema has already left. She went to the hospital. Her daughter, Kara, is there now. The police officer is talking to her daughter, Kara, and Kara is asking if she should get her mom back on the phone. This is where Zalema turns. She becomes a little bit annoyed. She asks them to leave her house. She threatens to get a lawyer. You know, just like every grieving widow would do. Hello. Hello. I'm Mark Gordon. What's that? Do I need to get my laptop on the phone? You can if you'd like, or you can just talk to me first, then I can see if you need to get on the phone. Hey, um, here's somebody that, you know, come to talk to us, like, but you know, speak up so you can get what, you're, what they're going to say. Yeah. Hello, my name is Mark Ward. I'm a sergeant with the Governor Police Department. Who am I speaking with? You want to bring him in? Yes. Yeah. Zulema, what can I do for you, ma'am? trying to make things worse ma'am we're not trying to have anybody uh feel bad or or be anxious but someone died in your house today and, and we're not going to leave your, your house until we finish that investigation so and we're going to secure it while we seek a search warrant from the judge and if the judge grants it then we'll uh conduct the search as necessary to finish the death investigation if the judge doesn't then we will leave but for right now, we're going to stand That's by in the right. house and control individuals' movements in the house. They're not required to stay here, so if they'd like to leave, they are free to leave. But we will not be leaving the house at this time. Okay. So, let me ask you this. So, why are you saying that someone died in the house when he wasn't even pronounced dead until he was in the hospital? Well, the incident started here. I get that he was pronounced deceased at the hospital, but all of that started here. It didn't start in the hospital. It started in this house. Okay. Is she just not very bright? I mean, she's like, nobody died in the house. Why are you saying somebody died in my house? Uh, somebody collapsed in your house. They had to start CPR in your house. doesn't really matter where they actually were pronounced. That's just a weird thing for her to throw out there, right? I mean, obviously, Zalema isn't the sharpest tool in the shed or however you want to word it. So it does make sense to me that somebody like that would be actually believe stuff fed to them, like the crap Lori and Chad was feeding to her, that she's one of the 144,000. I think somebody with that kind of a mind may be predisposed to being gullible and naive and being sucked into stuff like this, thinking she's bigger and better than she really is just by their power of suggestion. I don't know. What do you think? And like I said, we're, we're not trying to traumatize anybody. We're not trying to, to push this. And it, it, 
Okay, you, that, you have your right to that opinion. I understand that now. But we're, we're, we have a job to do, and, and unfortunately, sometimes that, that ends up making people feel uncomfortable. That's not our intent, but we have, we have our job to do, so that's kind of where we stand right now. And, and your children that are, are here are adults, and they're free to leave. We're not holding them here, so but we are going to hold the house while we seek the search warrant. So, and they're, they're not necessarily free to move around the house and just go do whatever they want, so... They can leave the house, they're free to leave that, but they're not free to wander around the house while we secure it. Okay. Okay? Okay, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to get a hold of my lawyer and see if then she can make a baby to me or I still call back. Okay, I, I have no need to speak to your lawyer because it's not going to change anything, but you're more than welcome to give him a call. You have every right to. Okay, yeah, that's what we're doing right now. Okay. Are you, are you guys on your way here? have any questions for us okay we can try and answer them anytime you have any questions just let us know okay and like I, I said to your mom on the phone you guys are free to leave if you choose to you're just not free to wander around the house okay and, and it's we have a responsibility as investigators to determine did something bad happen or is it just natural causes and uh, we do that because now Alex can't speak for himself for if something bad happened so that's why we do that Okay? okay? All right. You see what I mean? She's already talking lawyer, very concerned about the police being in the house. If you have nothing to hide, you wouldn't be that concerned, would you? You know, we do know at this point that the police were surveilling them, Alex and Zulema. They were under the watch. Things were getting really suspicious to law enforcement. So I can see why Zalema might be a little paranoid because she is, because she should be. Clearly she should be. So in the information, the police documents where they wrote down everything in their probable cause, all the information, all their notes, FOIA documents, there is a quote in there written by one of the detectives that spoke with Zolema that day. And it says, I asked Zolema if Alex ever had any visitors at her house. She said his niece came for Thanksgiving with her new husband. She identified his niece as Melanie. Melanie lives in Idaho. She said Melanie came to her house and spent time at her in-law's house before driving back to Idaho. I asked her about any siblings for Alex. She said he has six siblings, but does not have much communication with them. She said she knows his sister, Lori, and his niece, Melanie. She did not know where Lori lives. I asked her if she had a phone number for Lori, and she said the last time she tried texting Lori, the number was disconnected. She had met Lori a few times before when Lori lived locally. She had not seen Lori since she moved a few months ago. She did not think Lori was married. So let's break this down. I'm not sure if she knows how many siblings that they have because there were five. I'm going to give her that one. She may not know. But she does know that he did have communication with his siblings. She admits she knows Lori and Melanie, but no one else. She says she doesn't know where Lori lives. Well, maybe she doesn't know the address in Hawaii, but she certainly knew where she lived in Idaho because she went there. Remember, they picked her up from the airport. And then he says, I asked her if she had a phone number for Lori, and she said the last time she tried texting Lori, the number was disconnected. Well, we all know Lori changed her phone number a lot, and I'm pretty sure if the Chadster was doing these blessings over Alex, she knew exactly Lori's a way to get a hold of Lori. She said she met Lori a few times when Lori lived locally. Okay, big fat lie. She met Lori a lot. 
She had not seen Lori since she moved a few months ago. Lies. Lies, lies. And she did not think Lori was married. Biggest lie of all right there. Biggest lie of all. In the future, there is an interview with Zulema discussing the day that Alex died and discussing some cash that was left for Zulema in case something happened to Alex. It's a little bizarre, in my opinion, but go ahead, take a listen to this. Zulema explaining this cash. So let's talk about the bag of cash. Do you remember when he gave that to you? He didn't necessarily give it to me. He just a couple of days before he passed. I don't know if he was like one day or two days before he passed. He said to me, Zulema, if anything happens to me, I want you to know that there is money in a bag in the closet, and it's for you. He said, it's not much, but it's for you. Okay. Did you ever count the money that was in there? Or not how much was in there? Well, when, when, um, before he passed away, no, because I, I just said whatever, you know what I mean? I wasn't gonna touch his money, but after the, um, after he passed away, I asked the police to bring it down, and um, my daughter and her boyfriend started counting it. They did. And, and how much was I think that there must have been about probably between five and seven thousand dollars or something like that. Do you remember what else was in the bag? If you'd like to help support my show, please see the links in the show notes. I would really appreciate any donation. Nothing is too small to keep this show going. So much appreciate all of you that have donated so far. Remember, I'm a one-woman show. I am it. I'm the editor. I am the producer. I am the researcher. I am the voiceover. (laughs) I'm everything. And I do work full-time as a registered nurse. So I'm doing this on my days off and on my weekends. And I do enjoy it. And I think this story is a really important story to tell. So no matter what, I'm here until the end. But I do appreciate everyone and anyone that can help support the show. And again, thank you so much. I appreciate you all. Stay safe, stay well, and we'll be back. Thank you for listening to an episode of Afterglow Unveiling the Idaho Cult. I'm Kathy Brooks. Sources for this episode, KSL, Garna Mejia, Nate Eaton, East Idaho News, Justin Lum, Fox 10 Phoenix, Annie Cushy, Annie Lennox. Theme music by Dan 